Yeah. Okay. Anna, we're recording. It's great to uh, great to meet you. How are you? Great to meet you too, Daniel. I think we've been trying to do this for a while, so I'm glad we're finally able to talk. Well, I was alerted to your book, uh, the the Learning Game, by um, by the guy that's actually teaching our kids math, and we're paying mm -hmm. him with Bitcoin uh, because this is a, a Bitcoin podcast, a Bitcoin community. Uh, but the Bitcoiners, the the listeners to this show, know that I straddle uh, two worlds: the the world of alternative, in air quotes, education. Um, because this is actually the natural way to, to educate your kids. The alternative mm -hmm. is to lock them up in a school classroom for eight hours a day for 15 years with complete strangers. But, you know, whatever, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, and so I went and checked it out. And then I, I looked at our tweets and our DMs and we'd been DMing from way back in 2020. <laughs> when... During the pandemic. Yes, yes. And yep. I believe, were you, were you world schooling your kids? That's right. We did that. Between 2014 and 2017, we traveled long term with them and uh, fell into the world schooling, unschooling kind of ethos of things um, by by doing, you know, you learn by doing. And it was yep. uh, it was that it was that trip that, um, you know, it, that gave us the well, what gave us the confidence to take our kids out of the education system were many things. But one, the desire to take them on an, uh, an experiential learning journey. And mm -hmm. then people search the same people that you quote in your book, like John Taylor Ghetto, for example, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, another mm -hmm. one, uh, Peter Gray, all of these people mm -hmm. that have done amazing work before us and been ignored, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's people like you that come along with your new book and your experience and you can pick up the torch and carry this message on into the next four, five, six decades until we can really get people away from this system that I believe destroys kids. But mm -hmm. let's get a little bit about yourself. So mm -hmm. what's been your journey? And then we can start diving into all kinds of topics. Yeah. Um, before I share like about my journey, I just want to say that I think your comments are spot on. Um, a lot of the ideas, most of the ideas that I talk about, I did not come up with. Um, they're rather from all these giants in the alternative education space um, that have been working on this for years. And like you said, um, sometimes these ideas pick up their momentum, but then they quickly get forgotten. Um, and then, you know, the education system sort of like prevails. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of resurface these ideas over and over again until hopefully we continue. And I think we're making a lot of progress and we can talk about that today. Um, especially after the pandemic, but but absolutely. So I'm originally from Panama, um, but growing up, I moved around a lot, very much like you and your family. Um, so by the time that I was 14 years old, I had lived in 10 different, um, seven different countries and attended 10 different schools. And so I really got to get that inside look as a student um, in very different learning environments, quote unquote, different, because really when it comes to it, and I reflect on all this experience, they were pretty much the same. Um, and in order to sort of adapt and keep up with all the different academic expectations, even though, you know, the schools did vary, most of them were very traditional. There were some that were a bit more progressive, some were very religious, some were non-denominational. And so it really, you know, private, public, I got a little bit of everything. Um, but what I realized was that in order to sort of survive and again, adapt to all these expectations, I picked up on what I talk about in my book, um, the game of school, right? And this game is pretty universal. I didn't really realize until I became a teacher and I saw students playing the same game, but it's basically the things you do in order to survive this flawed system, right? And it becomes like a game, right? You 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 quickly could realize how many times you have to raise their hand to get that participation grade, what kind of questions they can ask, what kind of questions are are off limits, you know, what are the things you should say to be liked by your teacher, how not to get in trouble, you need to sit up straight, you need to be quiet, you need to pay attention, or at least pretend to pay attention, the kind of things you the tricks you had to pick up on to pass those tests and move on to the next grade level. So again, I saw it pretty much like a game, but it was not a game that I enjoyed. It was just sort of a game that I had to play, right? 
Um, and I wasn't really learning by playing this game for all these years, right? Real learning for me happened outside of school, right? When I was actually exploring my interests and doing what kids do naturally, right? We have this, or kids, when they're born, they have this natural capacity to learn and to explore and be curious. And we sort of train it out of them by putting them in this confined traditional settings that go against everything we know about how kids learn and how kids develop, right? Um, and so I played the game over and over again, but I was very lucky to have parents that when I left the school system, um, like left school during the day, they would really enable all those productive interests that I had. So they were able to keep that um, flame for self-directed learning alive. And so I loved talking and I, and I loved making friends and explaining things in ways that captured people's attention or so I was told by the adults around me. And so naturally I decided to become a teacher um, when I was older and I really wanted to work with kids and I realized how much I had to learn from them and how exciting it was. And so I started to study education and go through my ed program um, at NYU and when I was student teaching in the different placements, they make you sort of like stand at the back of the room and see what's going on and observe the teacher and pick up on strategies and this and that. I was really focused on the students. And that's when it dawned in me, like they were all playing, or most of them, the game of school. They were not really engaged. They were not really learning. They were not excited to be there. They were, you know, all this content that we were just making them memorize and all this knowledge, quote unquote, they would forget right after the test. And so, so many kids were falling through the cracks. And, and it was very clear that this was just one way to learn and one way to do things. And as we know, we're all very, very different. And so um, the kit for all those kids that don't sort of fit into this mold, it's very tragic. It's very unfortunate. Many of them never end up reaching their full potential. Many of them end up believing that they're not good at anything or they don't understand the things that they're great at or that they love doing or that they want to spend, you know, the next few years after they graduate doing. And so it was very alarming. And that was sort of the first time that I was like, wow. And all this sort of like memories from my childhood started to pop up. And so I was like, I'm going to do things differently in my classroom. And to a certain extent, I did. I deviated from the curriculum. I was kind of like that education rebel in all the different schools that I worked at. Um, but it worked out. Like the kids really enjoyed coming to school. And I, I feel like I was able to do things differently in my classroom. However, um, I became discouraged when I would see what would happen when they would move on to the next grades. Even when they had good teachers, they start to lose, you know, this ability to question everything and to be skeptics and to stand up for themselves and to think for themselves. And all the things that they used to enjoy naturally, you know, suddenly become like subjects and academics and, and all about the test. And so um, it was very, and, and, you know, Sir Ken Robinson, who I believe you've talked to or had on your podcast, yeah. uh, you know, before he, he passed away, he really opened my eyes and put it very eloquently to, you know, how schools are really crushing all these things, this creativity and this curiosity and this natural ability to learn by forcing them into these environments that make absolutely no sense. And there was a purpose for the way things are right now, 200 years ago, right? When we needed to train an army of soldiers and then when we needed factory workers and managers for corporations. But now in 2023, you know, the, the kind of skills that kids need in order to thrive in this ever-changing environment and all the autonomy that they need in order to become self-directed learners and lifelong learners, we're not really cultivating the skills in the schools. We're doing the opposite, or so I would argue. And so I ended up leaving the school system um, a few years ago when I realized, you know, there's no place for me here, um, but I do want to keep exploring the alternative education world. I had no idea how big it was and all the wonderful work that people have been doing and the families like you that have been deviating from the norm and doing things differently. And so I, I've been very passionate about this topic. I've been working really hard. I've been part of this startup called Synthesis, where we are really trying to pave the way for a new K through 12 system that's, you know, very, very different from what we know um, now and, and just being part of different alternatives. And I've been writing about all these ideas. And like you very well said at the beginning of this conversation, just kind of resurfacing all these ideas from the giants in education um, that have the courage to sort of like say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Let's do things differently. And so a lot of this idea has turned into the book, The Learning Game, um, which hopefully is the first one out of many. And yeah, so that's where I am now. Yeah, amazing. Okay, lots to go on here. So it seems to me you came to the same conclusion that John Holt came to when he was stood in front of his class as a teacher. And it's suddenly, and I've just had Pat Ferenga on a few episodes before this, and he's uh, 
carried on John's work, um, uh, growing without schooling ever since. And he's, um, updated John's books as well, but John suddenly realized, why is it I teach, but they don't learn. So you had the same epiphany. Um, I'm interested to know now at that, at that juncture, when you walked out of that classroom and you'd had that, um, epiphany, and then you took that into your own classroom and you tried to you know, fight against the, the curriculum and the system, which forces, and this is a, I try and I preach this all the time. I'm not against, uh, the teachers in the system. I believe the teachers are just as trapped as the students. It's just a different kind of entrapment. What, what the system does to, to teachers is truly dark and disturbing mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. take people like yourself who are born to be mentors that you, you know, your place, you're a born mentor. And though, so what you're attracted to, you're attracted to a place where the honeypot for the kids to go, because the kids are trapped to go there because the mother and father are trapped to go to their cubicles all day. Right. So they need the child state education system as a child daycare system. Mm -hmm. But then they force you to teach what they want, how they want it at the speed that they want it taught whether or not you agree with it or not. So mm -hmm. when you pushed back against that and you were trying to do things differently in your classroom, what did you face? Like the staff room politics must have been pretty hard coming your way. Absolutely. I, I love this question. I think I haven't been asked this before. Um, so so you, you're totally right. Most of the teachers that I've encountered have the right intentions and go into this profession with, you know, the, the right mindset. The problem is that, again, all these bureaucracies and all these standards and all those things that rules that they make you abide to make it really hard to do the things that we know deep inside that kids need and, and crave and the kind of experiences that we want to create. And so what I did, and it actually took me three years, the first three years, I followed the rules. I did everything as, you know, expected. I did tweak things a little bit in my classroom, but I would still leave homework and I would still, you know, do test prep. And so finally, you know, uh, when it got to my third year, I was like, that's it. I cannot continue this madness, especially um, anyone who walks into this, um, you know, very traditional schools when it's test prepping season. It's just insane. It's insane how, you know, the environment that we create the amount of stress and pressure that you feel from the teachers, from the students, from the parents, because we're, you know, everything becomes about this. And so if we were, if we did not have time before to focus on the things that really matter, imagine when we have to teach for the tests, like it just, it has become complete chaos. And so by the third year, I was like, that's it. I'm not going to test prep this year. I don't care what they tell me. Like, I'm just not going to do it. And, you know, teacher salaries are often tied to the performance of the students on this tests, right? In, in this particular school that I was at, it was the map tests, right? writing, reading, writing, and math. And it's like three hour long tests that kids have to take. And it's sort of like the SATs, but for like, you know, kindergartners all the way to 12th grade, it's insane. And so um, it's supposed to measure all the things that kids are learning, but really you're teaching from those books, uh, you know, specifically for the test. So I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. If my kids are learning, they're, they're learning and they're going to perform well in this test. And if not, then so be it. I'll get fired, I guess. And so I did not test prep that year. Um, and I was in fourth grade. And the test <laughs> um, season came up and I was like, OK, we'll see what happens. And the principal calls me to her office and she's like, Anna, what did you do? And I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, well, in math and in reading your, you know, the majority, like the, the majority of your classroom exceeded the expectations and exceeded their targeted growth. Um, I would love to know how you test prep specifically what you did so that we can share with the other teachers in the next professional development. And I was like, you know what? I did not test prep. And she's like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, no, I decided I, you know, I just, you know, focused on the things that I thought were important and, and making them fall in love with math and try projects and different things. And, and I, I, I guess it worked. And when I said that, she said, um, you know, that's very interesting. That was not the answer I was expecting. Um, don't worry about sharing this. I fear that this may go the wrong direction and teachers may sort of get the wrong message. So don't worry about it. Let's just leave it here. And that was when I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm leaving because even when the results show that, you know, when we do something different and when we don't focus on that madness that doesn't make any sense, the results are better. 
there's still from, you know, the administration and from the, like this pressure to be like, no, no, let's not go that way. I'm like, wait, why? Like the results are clearly showing what's happening. And so I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And, and, and I, you know, that's when I decided to leave, but that's just one example of the kind of things that I encountered. But um, in general, what, what I realized is when you have a classroom where there's a lot of real teaching and learning going on, it looks very different from what we're used to, right? So you walk in and this the students are not going to be, you know, this happened in my classroom. They were not sitting down quietly facing forward. Rather, they were standing up, sometimes sitting on top of the desk, in the floor, rolling around. It was very loud, very loud. Like anyone who walked in my room was like, oh, there's probably, there's so much chaos here. There's no control. But actually, that's when the kids were really learning, right? They were working in teams. They were talking. They were moving, which is what they're supposed to be doing at that age, right? Releasing all that energy. And they were doing most of the teaching. I was just kind of there as a facilitator to provide the right environment, the right resources, and the right support and prompt the right questions. And so, again, a lot of people walk in and they're like, Oh, they don't understand. And it, again, it's because we've been trained to believe that, oh, for learning to happen and, and a good classroom is when you walk in and everyone's quiet, the teacher's talking, all the kids are facing forward, oh, they're so well behaved. And that's not the reality. And so that's another example of the kind of things that you would see in my classroom. Um, I also had like no rewards. Um, I had a lot of fun things that we did for sure, but they were not tied to good behavior or good grades because I feel like you remove the intrinsic elements of learning, right? Like you're teaching kids to learn or to behave for a treat. And I and I think that we have that very sideways. Um, the kids in my classroom understood that they were learning for the sake of learning because they need this in order to continue evolving, right, as humans. And so um, they had a lot of fun in the classroom, but again, it was not tied to behavior or or, you know, academic grades. And so those were kind of like little tweaks that you would see. And then it turns out that none of this is new. None of this is, you know, this happens in the in 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 a non-traditional environment. And then the last one that I want to touch upon, because to me was sort of the biggest red flag. And I had never read about, you know, democratic schools before or Sudbury schools. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Um, but basically in this settings, they don't, they do it like on schooling and they don't really teach kids how to read or how to, they, they sort of pick up on this. And I had no idea because I had never done this research. But in my classroom, I remember being, especially when I taught the younger grades, like first and second grade, and we had to teach how to read. I was always like, very, very frustrated, like it didn't quite sit well that we had to force every single kid when they were seven or six to learn how to read with this like methods and instructions. And, and I would see how frustrated they would get. And I was like, well, what if they're not ready? Or what if this is not the right approach? And my biggest concern was that, yeah, most of them would eventually learn how to read, but then they did not want to read for pleasure anymore. Or the ones that did not pick it up right away were put in the reading remediation group and were told, you know, you, you, you have a problem. And we would tell their parents, you know, your kid is behind and all this. And I was like, are they behind? Like who said that kids have to learn how to read by seven? And when you start to do the research, it turns out that there's no research that shows that kids need to learn how to read by seven. What the research shows is that every kid matures at different times and different ages and different rates, and that they're all ready to learn how to read and all the other subjects at different moments, right? And when you force them before they're ready, which is what we tend to do in schools, that's when you end up with kids that don't want to then read for pleasure, don't understand the importance of continuing to read in order to continue to learn, right? And so, um, and a lot of these kids become, have these labels that become self-fulfilling prophecies and they believe that they're not good. And then that just carries on and on and on for sometimes the rest of their lives. And so that was another thing that I encountered that I was like, nope, like this is, this, this cannot be the way that things are. And so it turns out that it's not. There's a way more natural way to do it. And that's how people are doing it in the alternative education space in many instances. So I could keep going, but I'm going to stop yeah. there. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll build on that because um, Taylor Gatto, you know, he exposed this in his, well, probably in all three of his books that I've read. Um, the, the the big one, the uh, the underground history of the American education system where he talks about um, yeah, reading, writing, math, like uh, like you tried to do in your class. You stepped off of the curriculum and people excelled and you saw that they were above average. And, you know, Taylor Gatto talks about the research that shows literacy across reading, writing, math that is going down and has been going down steadily since um, the 60s, I believe. Uh, it was just absolutely, I mean, this is insane. This is research that we have these are data points that are you know indisputable 
but we still do the same thing. And then you go down mm -hmm. the question of, well, why? And that's when you start, that's when it starts getting dark because that's when you mm -hmm. start realizing this is just a full on psyop to keep people, mm -hmm. you know, again, one of his books, mm -hmm. Dumbing Us Down, uh, he talks about um, his training as uh, as a teacher. And point number one was, my it's my job to confuse. And when I read mm -hmm. that, I was like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. that's like a knife through the heart. And, and you, you, you're mm -hmm. taken back as a kid to that first day at like big boy, big girl school, you know, that you've been um, hyped up to believe is going to be amazing when you finally get there and you get there and you are just completely and utterly exhausted and confused come the fifth day. Mm -hmm. You know, you've finished that week because as John would say, so I'm teaching math between 9 and 10.30. And then we're talking about planets between 10.30 and 11.45. Then you've got a short break and you've got to go and mix with all of these strangers you don't even particularly like. And then you come back and you've only got 38 seconds in a corridor to get between, you know. It, it, and then you're going to come back and do algebra and after that some human biology and a little bit of chemistry thrown in and a bunch of homework to take home. That is nonsense. Like this is complete and it, that's child abuse. That mm -hmm. it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be, mm -hmm. you, you can't be doing that to kids. And so when it was, uh, uh, I still, it, it, it still shocks me that mm -hmm. this is what we are doing to kids today. It shocks me that we did. I, I believe that in a hundred years time are hopefully shorter. People will look back on, you know, the last three generations like, whoa, like, mm -hmm. what were they doing? Mm -hmm. What were mm -hmm. they doing mm -hmm. to kids? Mm -hmm. Like, this is uh, unbelievable. And talking of kids, Lauren's just walked in. This is my daughter, Lauren. And Hi, she usually asks the you? first nice question on each podcast. She's uh, oh. 12, coming up 13. Uh, but she was nice. just on a, um, a self-directed education class. Uh, so I know you're at Synthesis. <laughs> These guys are at Cubrio. We've not used Synthesis yet. So mm -hmm. we should definitely come over and check it out because we've used OutSchool. Yes. But, uh, yeah, but yes. but Lauren, okay, what's your question for for Anna? What is wrong with the education system? Oh, <laughs> Ooh, that's a very very packed, loaded question. I think, um, and something that I talk a lot about because I think that um, parents have the best intentions in mind and they want the best for their kids, but they sometimes don't realize the unintended things that are happening. So we've been talking about this already in the podcast, but I guess I'll touch upon a few that are very wrong, um, starting with this idea of grouping kids by age and putting them into grade levels, right? Um, and I often ask this question, like when in the real world do you only interact with people your age? And I can only think about it in a school setting, right? And there's a lot of things that happen when you do this, when you break kids into ages and you put them. So we were just talking about your dad and I, how kids mature and at different rates and at different paces, right? And so when you group them by age, you're putting a speed bump, right? You're saying you get to learn about this up to here. You get to try this challenges, but up to here, there's a cutoff. But what if this kid that's younger could do more, right? They would never know, right? Because we're stopping them. We're putting this barrier. And so um, when you remove the grade levels, and I've seen this in different mixed age group schools that I've student taught, um, it's very, very different. You have younger kids advancing and going way faster and, and, and more excited about everything in general because they get to try what older kids are doing. And then you have older kids crystallizing their learning because one of the best ways to learn is to teach something. That's when you know that you actually know the content. Um, and so they get to teach the younger kids, right? And they sort of be that older kid and more mature kid. And, and that's exciting as well. And so there's a lot of organic teaching and learning that happens when you remove those great levels, which I think is one of the big things that's wrong with the education system. It's also not the way that we interact in the real world. And so that's one. Then we were also just talking about your dad and I about how um, we constantly interrupt kids um, learning throughout the day when we um, put all the knowledge into subjects, right? We're sort of like, oh, this goes here. We're going to learn reading for 45 minutes and we're going to ring the bell. Then you need to switch to um, science and then to math. And so we're constantly interrupting kids. And sometimes they're just starting to get excited on a topic and they just have to like shut, shut it down and move on to the next thing. We know that learning doesn't work that way. Learning is interconnected and it's very 
important to understand how the different subjects fit within each other. That's why learning through projects or through problems is a much better approach because you actually get to see the synthesis between the different things, right? And you actually get to put things into practice, which takes me to my next point. Um, all the things that we learn in school most of the time don't have practical applications or we don't get to apply them until God knows when later on in life. And we know research shows that knowledge decays really quickly. And if you don't put into practice what you learned in the next 14 days, then you forget about it. How many times, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you actually have this experience because I think you have not been to a traditional school system, um, but most of the time what happens is that kids will cram for a test and then after the test, they'll forget about the content, right? Because again, they never had a chance to put it into practice. And so um, often I would get this question from my students like, Ms. Fab, when am I going to use this? They need to understand the relevance of the things that we're asking them to do, right? Or asking them to learn or asking them to pay attention and be interested in. And oftentimes I was like, I have no idea. I'm 32. I've never used this information yet. And so that was very discouraging. And it also pops up this big problem that we have in the education system, which is that it lacks most of the things lack practical applications or are very, very outdated. Or, you know, you can't teach just in case kids will ever use that. You need to teach what I call on demand, which is like right away where they can apply right away. And again, projects are really good for this. Um, and I could I could keep going. <laughs> um, I don't know how many, because I have a lot of different things that are wrong with the education system, but maybe those sort of cover the big ones. What do you think is wrong with the education system, Lauren? Pretty much everything. <laughs> so Lauren has, uh, she has been to, uh, traditional school here in France. Um, mm -hmm. We used that as an immersive experience so she could learn mm -hmm. the language along with her brothers and sisters. Her oldest mm -hmm. sister decided to stay in the uh, the system. The other three came mm -hmm. out, uh, mm -hmm. much to my happiness. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like like we talked about in the beginning, we had uh, three years just traveling around, uh, world schooling, bouncing around different countries and mm -hmm. all kinds of different learning experiences every single day, as you well know. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's that, that one. Oh, okay. But Anna, how are your kids ever going to socialize if you don't send them to school? Right. That's, that's the big one, right? Which actually goes back to this point of the mixed age groups. And, um, I think that, that the, so, first of all, when people ask me this question, which by the way, I think it's a valid question because those that are not as involved as you and I are with the trenches of what's going on, um, and are just sort of, they think that, you know, because things were different, you know, when our parents went to school, like they did. And, and, and Peter Gray talks a lot about this. There was a lot more freedom, um, and, and a lot more movement and a lot more socialization going on. Um, but things have become way more restrictive and they're becoming even more restrictive every day. You know, to the point where kids are having 15 minute recess, which is bananas because it goes against everything we know about how kids develop and all the movement that they need. Um, and, and of course, we can talk about this later, but then they get labeled with those ADHD. And it's like, no, you're just not giving them the time and the space to do the things they're supposed to be doing. So obviously, these are sort of like the outcomes, the behaviors that, you, that they're starting to show. But um, I think that people think that there's a lot of socialization going on because you're surrounded by other kids all day and you get, but there's very little talking. There's very little, even when you do like teamwork and team projects, like it's very, you know, one person takes the lead or there's a lot of instructions. So there's not a lot of time to actually like socialize and connect. Then this notion of so what if you don't connect with all the kids that you're surrounded with, you know, in your classroom, those 24 kids or 30 kids, right? You keep on moving on with them. And it's like, well, what if you don't have anything in common? What if you, you know, Online, for example, you have access to kids from different ages and different countries and different, you know, which may align better with your interests, right? And then all this, you know, in the hallway, you're not allowed to talk, you know, in the breaks, like you were saying, you have like 38 seconds between one class and the other. When are kids actually socializing? Because if you don't let them talk in class, you don't let them talk in the hallway, they have 15 minute recess. And the answer I would get was like, oh, well, in the bus. I'm like, okay, so the reason why you're sending your kids to school is to socialize and their answer is in the bus, then there's something clearly wrong here. And I think that, you know, when you talk to kids that there's this big misconception that homeschoolers or world schoolers or unschoolers are lacking the social aspect. And I think that that's, that's very, very wrong. Um, these kids actually get to interact with people in their community. They get to be outside a lot more. They get to actually do things like you would do in the real world, right? They're not like what's abnormal to me is being confined in a, in a 
in four walls with 24 kids your same age and not being able to socialize. And so that's sort of like what I say. And, and especially now that I've seen how it works in the alternative education world, these kids sort of create their own education like a menu, a lot of them. And so you get to enroll them in different activities where they're you know playing sports or doing music or this and that. And they're constantly surrounded by other kids and adults. And I think that there's a lot more natural socialization happening there. And now with the online world and all this like self-directed online community, like all that I think is way more real world application than what's happening in schools. Yep. And for those people that think kids are socializing on the bus, have you actually got on a bus where a bunch of school kids have just got out of school? I tell you what they're doing. They're looking at their phones mm -hmm. and they're looking, they're scrolling through TikTok or Snapchat or trying to connect with their actual friends who they mm -hmm. aren't forced or to not. socialize with each day. Well, that's such a great point. I hadn't even thought yeah. about that because in my time we didn't have phones. But yes, that's that's pr uh, probably very true. The, the, I mean, most parents are probably thinking, why is it that they uh, the kids get home from school, disappear into their bedroom, don't talk to us, mm -hmm. and go straight onto the phone to chat with their friends in air quotes that they've been with all day long? I'm like, yeah, because they're not allowed to talk to them, so they have totally. to get home and go into a peaceful room. Mm -hmm. to make a phone call so they can actually mm -hmm. and what are they talking about they're talking about the shit day that they had at school mm -hmm. and what this teacher said and what this teacher didn't do and how unfair it is and i've got so mm -hmm. much work it's just a death loop of negativity mm -hmm. that they can't escape with like they feel trapped in, in, and not being able to talk to your parents about it because they don't understand it or, or they're like you know with the best intentions most of them but it's like well I, I did it i went through it and i survived you suck it up you know you do it like it's fine it's like well no like, you know, I, I, I was fine. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if this is the generation that's going to be shaping our future. Like, how are we not like super focused on giving them the best learning experiences? I will exactly. never understand. Uh, right. Do you want to jump off? Yeah. Are you, you're happy staying. What do you want to do? If you if you're out of questions, you're out of questions. Up to you. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to jump. Right. Okay. <laughs> Great to meet you. Yes, yes, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So there's a few points there as well that uh, that I want to um, keep keep kind of hitting on, really. Um, and Naomi Fisher has done some great work about this. I'm not sure if you've read her books. No. Um, the the first one uh, she released was called uh, "Changing Our Minds," and um, she, like you, she hopped around lots of different schools growing up. Um, mixes of private state, different countries or whatever else, and was playing the game of school very much, um, got great grades and whatever else. Uh, she became a clinical uh, psychologist and it was her job to uh, diagnose ADHD from within the system. So she would have a practice, but she was working, I believe, Naomi, forgive me if I'm getting this wrong. I think she was working uh, within like the NHS system in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until she realized that there was a two-year waiting list that suddenly like this, what, what if it's not the kids? What if it's not the kids? What if it's the system? And that was her turning point and entry into the rabbit hole of what is really truly going on here. And, and I remember Sir Ken Robinson as well, talking about um, ADHD. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a great uh, little chat there. And he, he was almost fully canceled for that, uh, for, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming out mm -hmm. and saying, Basically, mm -hmm. something going, something's going on here where there is a darker force involved and somebody else is making a lot of money out of the diagnosis mm -hmm. that comes in through the, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, you know, the prescription of the, the drugs that are being pushed onto these kids. And it's like his classic line, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you force an, uh, an eight-year-old kid to sit down for five to seven hours a day and perform low grade clerical work don't be surprised if they get a little bored and begin to fidget and might in air quotes play up or play around mm -hmm. but that's when they get put in the the naughty boy or naughty girl class mm -hmm. and the parents get called in and this is what mm -hmm. naomi talks about this this little trick that's been played uh, and again it's not the teachers it's the teachers following their training this is what comes down mm -hmm. from above so they're trained mm -hmm. to bring in the parents uh to uh, almost sorry um, i'm here i'm here yep to almost shame the parents 
into believing that their their son or their daughter has some kind of problem because they can't sit still and they're behind on reading or they can't do this or they can't do that. They're not paying attention. They're playing the clown in class. All of this classic stuff, which you know you're you're told to your face, and then the parent faces this um, blame or brain dilemma, and the blame mm-hmm. is it's my fault. I'm not a good parent. Mm-hmm. I need to be harder on my child at home and put more pressure on them. Or the brain, oh, maybe they have something wrong and it's just genetic and it's not my fault because I'm not a bad parent. It's a trap and it's set mm-hmm. and it's set mm-hmm. by, oh, you know, I re- I, it just makes my blood boil. And, and um, mm-hmm. John goes into all of this in his you know in his big book uh like where the education system came from where it was formed the formation of the mm-hmm. general education board back in 1903 mm-hmm. by yes mm-hmm. who jd rockefeller and chums and what it became and how it was monopolized and then the regulatory capture that we face mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you can only go on to do that thing as a career if you can prove to us that you can, like you said, you can wrote, memorize these facts better than the next person. And then, by the way, we preordained ourselves to give you a certificate for that. And you mm-hmm. can only go further if we... Anna is so it's, sick. Yeah. And I just want to mm-hmm. wake as many people up as I can because, mm-hmm. again, something you said, oh, it's all right for me. I had to go through it and I turned out just fine. This isn't mm-hmm. fucking good enough. Like you wouldn't, mm-hmm. if you did a 10-year prison sentence for a crime you didn't mm-hmm. commit, you wouldn't then expect somebody else to go through it and turn out fine, mm-hmm. right? There's, mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. so bad. And Peter mm-hmm. Gray does compare school to prison, and he's right. Mm-hmm. Prisoners do have mm-hmm. more freedoms than students. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. absolutely, there's mm-hmm. my rant. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, it's 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 you're right, and and I share a lot of your feelings, and it's that's why I spend so much time talking about the problems with the education system. Some people are like, "Oh, why why does she talk like talk about the solutions? Talk about those?" And I'm like, "Well, yes and no. Like, I, of course, we need to talk about the solutions and what we can do, but we also have to talk about the problem because we need to wake up a lot of people that." Deep inside, they know this because they somehow either went through this system, but they were told all these things. So they're sort of numb. But when they start to hear, they're like, wait a second. Huh? I, I th- This kind of resonates. Oh, sorry. One second. One second. Yeah, no problem. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, this kind of resonates. And, um, you know, I, I think we need to be asking more questions and, and sort of realizing that there are better alternatives. And, you know, um, it's very sad when you see what's going on with with all that, you know, uh, farm, like, I'm definitely going to check out Naomi's book, because I'm, I'm very much at a deeper level, like I, I went through it myself as as a kid, you know, I was that hyperactive kid that eventually, you know, the teachers were like, she's super disruptive, it doesn't matter where we sit her, she's going to talk, like, what do we do? And they told my parents, get her screened, she probably has ADHD. And the doctors, of course, because it's a whole you know, chain. We're like, absolutely, let's medicate her. My parents thought they were doing the right thing, right? And we talk about it now that I'm an adult and they're like, they regret so much. But at the same time, I'm like, it's okay. Like you, you know, you were taught to believe everything they tell you. You were taught to believe what authority says, you know, and and if doctors were telling you that your child has ADHD and your teachers were telling you that your daughter has ADHD and that the right thing was to medicate her, like, of course, you just blindly trusted that. I feel like this generation and our generation is sort of like questioning a bit more and, and having the guts to say, wait, because the doctor said it, or because I saw it on TV, or because I read that article, because my teacher said it, it doesn't mean, or because it's in the textbook, it doesn't mean it's true. And so um, I, I was medicated for many years. And, and when I saw Sir Ken Robinson's um, TED Talk, I identified so much because I, I am convinced that this medicine tampered down all the elements of my personality that make me who I am today, right? All this passion and energy and desire to do and this and that, it, it, it's my personality. And, and it was tampered down for many years with this medicine. Then when I became a teacher, I started to get all these requests from parents telling me, please help me fill out this form that the doctor needs from the teacher so that we can start medicating my kid. And I'm like, wait a second. No, 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 your kid is totally fine. And they're like, no, but they won't stop moving and running around and they can't sit still and they can't concentrate. And I'm like, 
it's because they're bored or they're not interested in it or because we're putting them in environments that don't make sense. Like your kid is fine. And I had to really push back on so many parents that thought in their hearts that they were doing the right thing, but really they're just blindly trusting again, this system that is very corrupt. And I've also almost gotten canceled for talking about this, but you know what? Um, I, I, it's I, I went through it myself and then I went through it as a teacher and I truly believe this and I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, but but that's what I believe. I believe it's a fabricated disease. Um, yes, there are people that may have some deficit, you know, attention deficit disorder at some levels, but not the amount of kids that we are, you know, um, diagnosing like it's just crazy. And so. Um, I, I I often recommend switch your kid from environment, find a forest school, find somewhere where they're like releasing energy. And uh, one, one sec, I'm just going to continue talking and use the other camera, okay? Sure. Because yeah. there's something, one second, yeah, let me just keeps, switch. That, that's fine. Yeah, one second. I'm just going to use this one now. Okay. Um, and find, you know, a different, a different setup because clearly the answer is not medicating them. Like that's, 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 I don't think that that's the answer for most of the kids. And so I think, um, Jordan Peterson also talks very, very straight up about this, right? And and I think that that, yeah, it's just a matter of thinking about it and realizing that it's true. And and it's and you know, I'm I'm often surprised by how we teach kids not to question things and not to, and you know, like you, they open the note that like their, their textbook in science and they see the the food pyramid, which ended up being the complete opposite. And we still teach them in school. And so as a result, half of the American population is obese. And yet we continue to teach them that they should be eating carbohydrates and they should not be eating a lot of protein. And, they should, and it's like, wait, what? No, no, no. And so anyway, I think that one of the best things that parents can do, whether they have their kids in school or not, is to teach them how to question things and, and find answers for themselves and not believe everything that gets thrown at them, right? Because oftentimes it's wrong. <laughs> and so, yeah. It's, I'm so glad you are talking up about it and um, risking that cancel culture because, you know, what? what otherwise what? More mm -hmm. kids just end up addicted to these drugs and completely suppressed mm -hmm. by these drugs. These mm -hmm. and the the people for the people forcing these. I mean, look at the incentive structure. The incentive structure is to sell as many drugs as possible, and it's the same people that are uh, all caught up in the uh, American Medical Association as are caught up in the education system. So that it, it's just a it, it's a it's, it's a funnel for them. It is. To sell. It's business. It, it, yeah, and yeah. it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And the kids are it's it's so so bad. But it's a very touchy subject because mm -hmm. parents are desperate. They mm -hmm. need the daycare. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's it's a trap. But if you if you don't educate more people about it, um we can't rescue these people. Yeah. Right. And we can continue creating all, like we need a lot of resources and effort and more people joining the alternative education space in order to sort of take down the system. Right. And, and you know, when your daughter asks, like, what's wrong? Well, the fact that it's a daycare is one of the biggest problems because parents, of course, most families need a place to drop their kids off. That's quote unquote safe. And I say quote unquote, because I don't know how it's in the UK or in, but it's in the US, it's no longer the case. Like you have kids tr being trained for, you know, lockdowns and, and, you know, attacks and this and that and the guns and like, it's insane. So it's no longer a safe place where you're dropping your kids up. But that's another topic that's also like very concerning nowadays. Are you, I overheard a mom the other day saying that she's sending her seven-year-old kids to school with a bulletproof vest under their uniform, which mm. obviously it's extreme. And it, this is in Miami, by the way, which, but I'm like, uh, wow, like this is just, out, it's it's out of control. It's out of control. Like I cannot believe that these are the conversations that parents are having nowadays. So anyway, um, we do need to find a way for parents to be able to at least like those that have to go to work, like drop their kids off somewhere where they can be doing their self-directed learning or, you know, um, so that this actually works because there are a lot of families that don't have as much flexibility as you and I have, um, you know, that we work from home or that, you know, we have. And, and so that more parents can actually like take up on this. But what I talk a lot about in my book is for those parents that are not ready or just cannot pull their kids out of traditional school right now, but understand and and are, you know, alarmed by all these horrible things that are happening, there are things that you can do at home. And I do believe that the best teacher and the best education you will ever receive comes from home. So the kind of things that you're reinforcing when your kids get out of school 
are even more important than what they're learning in school, right? And how you're enabling them and how you're cultivating their passions or their curiosity and how you're helping them unlearn a lot of the things that they're learning in school, um, which makes me think of, like you said, like your older daughter that decided to stay there. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of conversations that you have at home where you know, because uh, I would see this, sometimes kids come home and parents have been so conditioned to believe that everything that happens in school is good. And that's where the learning happens and the teachers, right? And da, 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 when they come home with a bad grade, they don't even sit down and they're like, oh, you got a bad grade, you're punished or what happened? Or, well, what, why don't you sit down and try to assess first, what, what was, what was your kid learning? Maybe your kid does know it, but they're not good test takers. Maybe they're not interested in the topic. Maybe, you know, there's so many reasons. And so I invite parents to question that and to take the reins for their kids' education. And that doesn't mean you need to sit down and homeschool them, but that does need, mean that you need to be very much involved and make sure that, you know, if they're not in the optimal environment in school, then what are you doing at home to sort of save them from all those things that they are being conditioned to believe and 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 learn? Yeah. Well, you, you asked about what's going on in the UK. Um, obviously, we're not there. We're in France. We have a clearer picture of what's going on here kids are getting destroyed um mm -hmm. just through like the uh it, the, the bullying like uh is mm -hmm. is rife it's endemic and it's top down mm -hmm. you know we're, we're talking about the the teachers here that are mm -hmm. under like the pressure from the state to perform right it's all about performance mm -hmm. uh and so what do you get you get snickety remarks you get um teachers that are just completely and utterly beaten around by the system they um that, you know, that they expect, you know, strict classroom uh, mannerisms and behavior. And I know in the UK, uh, the weirdest thing about the UK is this, this insistence on uniform. Like this is to me just another level of child abuse that I will never, ever understand. To force a child into an ill-fitting pair of shoes, trousers, blazer, tie, itchy shirt, and not even be allowed to take the blazer off during a classroom without raising your hand to ask. I'm like, guys, wake up, wake mm -hmm. up. Look what they're doing to your kids. This is mm -hmm. so freaking wrong. And you mm -hmm. also get fined if you take your child out of school. If you want to go on holiday with your child, maybe you've got family that live in a different country like ours. But if my brother takes his kids or either of my brothers take the kids out of school for a Friday and a Monday to come and have a long weekend, with their uncle and their cousins and their auntie in a different country where they're going to be learning about different foods, different cultures, be exposed to different language, different landscape, fine. And if you do it again, mm -hmm. the fine gets higher. And if you do it again, the kids' grades go down. Like this is absolutely because they get marked on attendance. Like this, that is, this absolutely is so wild. nuts. It's, it's nuts, absolutely Anna. wild. It's absolutely wild. And I think that until we start like questioning this and, and, and stand up and say, no, like this, like, I remember whenever the kids would go on vacation, the parents would be like, okay, so what's the homework? What's the work that they have to do while they're gone? And I'm like, nothing. Enjoy. They're going to be learning way more in this trip than they're going to be doing in my classroom. So please enjoy them. And their homework is when they come back to share everything they learned with us. Like that's their homework. Like forget about taking paperwork, like that whole notion of like that. And then homework, like kids are in school for five, like, like you said, five to seven hours a day. And then they get to go home and they have to continue doing homework. Like how does that even make? sense they're not learning anything from it other than to hate you know their time at home it's like they should mm -hmm. be spending time with their families or you know being bored by inactivity so that creative ideas come to play or have time to engage in projects of their own you know and you know what you mentioned about the the, the uniform is one of the silliest things that we do because um, you know, kids already lack so much autonomy in school because we tell them everything. We, you know, we tell them what they're going to learn, how they're going to learn it, what they need to wear, what side of the paper they need to write on, you know, where they have to sit, who they can work. Like we tell them everything. We've removed all their autonomy. And so we also tell them what to wear. Like that doesn't make any sense. If you look at what humans need in order to develop, they need autonomy, they need competency, and they need relatedness, which are three things that I talk about in my book that they're not receiving in school. And then parents wonder why, like you said, they go, they go home and they lock themselves in their rooms and they go online. You know why? Because that's the only moments for many kids in their days that they get to actually 
make choices for themselves, choose who they're talking to, at what time, how they're talking, you know, like how they dress their characters in their video games, like what levels to play. Like for, for some kids, that's the only autonomy that they're feeling. And we know that just like our body needs, um, you know, fats and protein and carbs, our psyches need to feel autonomy. We need to feel like we're in control of something. And if we're not, and in schools, like you said, and like, you know, John Taylor Gatto and like Peter Gray say, kids have sometimes twice as more restrictions as incarcerated felons. Like that is just bananas. Like I cannot believe that this is where we've gotten to. Like this is childhood, the most important time arguably of their lives, right? The moment where we are cultivating all these attitudes and all these things that are going to then be with them for the rest of their lives. And 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 really we're doing it in this environment that 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 in my mind create way more negative things than positive. Like it just it's just very sad. It's very tragic. And you said something there about uh, homework and how, well, what does it teach them? Well, truly it teaches them to hate their time at home. Mm -hmm. It's a psyop. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. done. They know what they're doing. They mm -hmm. know what they're doing. It's an attack on mm -hmm. the family. It's a breakdown of the family to make them like, uh, you know, more dependent and more <sighs> hold on to your kids by Dr. Gabo Mate. For anybody that doesn't, you know, isn't following what we're talking about here. He blows it all apart. Like he's like this. Mm -hmm. it, and he's a clinical psychologist as well. Uh, mm -hmm. the data the research all of the points are out there and they all point to the same destructive force in our mm -hmm. lives it's forced compulsory mm -hmm. schooling and in a lot mm -hmm. of the uh, i know in a lot of the states in the u.s it is legal like you, no problem you can take your kids out of school in europe mm -hmm. here it's illegal in a lot of countries and they really try and tight trying to tighten things because they know that they're losing a the grip on society if mm -hmm. god forbid we had and it's my belief that the the default state of a human being is entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we get that beaten out of us mm -hmm. through 15 mm -hmm. to Absolutely. 20 years of being at school. You're now mm -hmm. following entrepreneurial mm -hmm. pursuits. Could mm -hmm. you, I mean, 10 years ago, could you have even thought of that? Like, no, no. you would, right? But why? Absolutely. Absolutely not. And I think that they know, like you said, they know exactly what they're doing. They teach you to fit in. They need, they, they teach everybody to sort of like follow this one path. And they tell you, this is how you become successful. These are the people you need to look up with. Here's how you get here. You know, it doesn't matter if you get to the same answer, a different, no, no, I, I want like, you know, the process needs to look the same. And so anyone that sort of deviates from that path oh they're the rebels they're the troublemakers they're, and if you actually look in history who are those entrepreneurs that have made it and that are creating amazing things for humanity those are the rebels those are the ones that would skip class to actually work on the things that they were passionate about those were the quote-unquote troublemakers and so it's so crazy because I feel like kids kind of know that they know they're like wait a second you're telling me to look up to all this but I know that this other people made it a very different way those are the people I look up to but but god forbids I say this in school right and so it's really crazy it's really crazy and 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 if you look at a lot of people that have become successful in the real world many of them have dropped out of their college degrees or their their, their high school degrees and so why so that they can actually spend time doing the things they're calling right the things that they want to spend time doing and I think that that's what it takes to be successful right when you find something you're very passionate about and you have a unique ability that you build over time and you're willing to spend hours and hours and hours working on this and you know that's how you achieve great things how often do kids have space to do this in school? Very little. And that's why I say to parents, help your kids when they get home, find that thing that they're irrationally passionate about and they're obsessed with, even if you don't get it, you know, even if it's something that you're like, wait, how are they going to make a living out of it? Well, just wait, you know, if you support them and you give them the resources and you give them the space and the motivation and you make them believe that they can actually change the world then then they will figure out a way to make a living out of it. And so I feel like more parents need to hear that and realize that, you know, um, because uh, parents that do things differently often get, you know, it's it's very hard to stand the pressure of the other parents around them, right? Because they start questioning and they're like, oh, you have one shot with your kid's education. And it's like, well, not really. You know, you can, you get to try many different things actually until you find what fits and you're not really harming them. Like I would argue that you're harming them more if you just leave them the entire time in the traditional school system. And it happens to be that that's not the way that they learn. Because 
I really fast caveat, like my husband, for example, he was, you know, he, he actually fit that mold of the traditional student and it worked for him and he actually enjoyed school and, and he wanted to stay there. And that's so at the beginning when we would have conversations, he wouldn't get it. He was like, what are you talking about? I loved school. Like I loved the structure. I loved sitting in the front and listening to my teacher speak for hours. And I believe him because they're different kinds of kids. And the problem is that that's the minority, but yet that's the only way that school teaches, right? And so if your kid is not that, you know, like my husband that fits perfectly, then you have to find alternatives so that they don't lose that spark and all those wonderful things that kids are already born with. Mm -hmm. Now in your book, you busted a few myths. And one of those myths was this thing around um, learning how you learn. Am I, am I right and think, yeah. Uh, to tell me um like learning how to learn yeah the, you were like uh, there was um you list we're, we're, we're kind of gaslit into believing you're a kinetic learner or you're a oh you, the learning styles yes the learning that's, styles yes yes okay. that's a very interesting one you know yeah. most people have been told at some point in their lives that they're either a visual learner or an auditory learner or you know kinesthetic learner and that's sort of like the way that you learn and there are all these little tests that you can do and I fell into that trap you know when I was a teacher I was like I want to cater my lessons to all my students so I better figure out like what are their learning styles so that I can tweak my lessons and you know to sort of like teach to their learning style well it turns out that there is no such thing as a learning style learning is interconnected right and we learn when we again can see how different things fit in different things we do have different learning predispositions, right? So at a certain time and moment, we may prefer to learn something by watching a video, sometimes maybe by listening to a podcast, sometimes maybe by sitting down and having a great conversation or having an interview. So it changes depending on the topic, depending on the time, depending on the day. And so what happens when you tell kids like, oh, this is your learning style? They believe that, right? Or to adults, they believe that. And so it becomes sort of like we're cultivating this fixed mindset where they think, oh, I no, no, don't even play that podcast for me. I can't learn that way. Like I'm not an auditory learner. It's like, well, not really. And depends. Right. And so that was one that was like, a, you know, I was like, oh my God, like I've, I've believed for so many years, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I need to be doing, and I need, and I think by the way, that we're all kinesthetic learners, we all learn by doing. However, um, I, you know, I became more open to learning through podcasts and through visuals and this and that, when I realized that I have all these abilities, right. It just matter. It's just a matter of what I want to use at the moment. So I often tell parents, don't, you know, make them believe that they have one learning style, teach them that they have a, a, a toolbox, right, of different like things that they can grab and pull depending on the subject that they want to learn about. And there's been a lot of research that shows and debunks, you know, this myth. And yet, you know, 70% of teachers, last time I checked, that was the stat, um, believe this, right? Because again, it's one of those things that they teach you in ed school, at least in my case. And I was like, yep, check learning styles, got it. And I didn't do my work of, wait, is that true? Does that make sense? Let me figure it out myself. Let me do a little bit of research. And so it goes back to this idea of teaching kids not to let anything unexamined into their heads and actually do the work themselves. Um, even if, you know, mom and dad tell you or your teacher, and, and I'm not telling you like, oh, race rebels, although to a certain extent, kind of, but there's an appropriate way to do this, right? Um, and I talk a lot about like teaching them to be skeptics so that they can debunk this kind of myths. Yeah, and, and define a rebel, right? What's a rebel? Well, mm. we've been given the definition of a rebel, somebody that rebels against the system. Oh, wow. Mm. What uh what a <laughs> what a nice word for you to have uh, you know, it's again, it all comes from the same place. Uh mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about uh synthesis. What is mm -hmm. synthesis? If people mm -hmm. are listening, because let's leave listeners uh who I mean, if they've listened to my podcast, uh, they've heard me talk about this many times, but there's got to be actionable points for people to be mm -hmm. able to go and research for themselves. Synthesis is one of those actionable points. So mm -hmm. if you just want to give us uh, the rundown uh, of what it is, what it provides and mm -hmm. what it might be able to, to help people with if they are thinking of transitioning away from the normal education system to a more self-directed or, or again, in air quotes, alternative approach. Yeah, absolutely. So first, just as a little background, the way that synthesis sort of came up was because back in 2014, Elon Musk, like many of us, was like, what's the point of traditional school? My kids are not quite learning. Like we need to come up with something better. They're learning what to think, not how to think. They're not engaged. They don't want to keep on learning. Like 
this is messed up. So he hired the best teacher in the school that he had his kids, a very creative teacher, somebody that I admire and get to work with every day, Josh Don, um, to create his own school at the SpaceX campus. And it was sort of like an experimental school. Elon was like, don't follow, don't abide to any of the rules or standards. Forget about this idea or crazy idea of grade levels. I want mixed stage groups. I want them all mixed together. Um, you know, no speed bumps and give them problems. Like forget about subjects, give them problems and real scenarios and then you teach the tool when or the resources or the knowledge when the kids need it so that they actually get to apply it right away so it touches upon a, a lot of the things that we've talked about today of how education should be so that it actually works and so right, josh I'm created like, so, sorry am i right mm -hmm. in thinking that was ad astra to begin with yes correct right. so that was ad astra yes correct mm -hmm. thank you for pointing that out so the school was called ad astra which means to the stars and it was really only for elon's five kids and you know a few of the spacex employees and their kids. And so it had 48 kids, but schools around the world would visit this experimental school because they would see that things were were working differently, right? And kids were actually like at a young age, they were learning mental models and they were actually applying the things that they were learning and they were solving real problems and they were super engaged. So they were like, oh, what can we learn from this? And so with the pandemic, um, they had no intention of expanding. With the pandemic though, they had to go online for obvious reasons. And this software engineer called Chris Man Frank, he was like, hey, what if we grab synthesis, which is the most popular class in the school, which is all problem-based and the kids are learning the soft skills that they're actually gonna need in the real world, right? Like how to fail construct how to pick yourself up, communication skills, but like real communication skills, like knowing when to lead, when to listen, and, and you know, how to work with people from different countries, from different ages, and, and do it, you know, in a shared aligned mission, and you know, how like uh, how to how to make decisions, how to understand trade-offs, like making decisions is a huge one, right? Because kids rarely have a chance to make decisions those first 18 years that they're in school, and then we release them into the world, and we're like, okay, go ahead, you know, start making decisions, start being independent, but then all their lives, they taught to be codependent and they have very little choices and, and 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 you know decisions to make and so anyway here it's like the opposite and it was all through these games right because that was the other thing that elon said he was like you know I don't have to force my kids to play video games. They're naturally inclined to them. Why? Because there's so much we can learn from video game designers and the things that they're doing, right? And it's really interesting if you actually see the kind of things that they're learning and the kind of skills that they're picking up when they're playing these games. And so anyway, so that was also a big element. It has to feel like play. It has to be fun. They they need to be able to want to come back the next day. And so those were the parameters. And so we, um, so Chris and Frank and Josh got together and they um, grabbed Synthesis and, and it turned into a company, right? And they and we we open it up to provide it to kids all over the world, different ages, and it's online. And so that's when they called me in and they were like, we need sort of a voice in the education space that's talking about these things to help us spread this message to parents. And I was like, well, let me check out the program. I was completely blown away when I was seeing the caliber of conversations that seven and eight year olds were having and, you know, how the kind of think real thinking for the first time, it was so refreshing to see like the kids were stepping up and they were solving real problems and they were learning things that they could apply right away to the real world. And they were passionate about what they were doing. And it was very active, even though it was in a computer, like they were standing up and yelling and talking and this, and there was just so much real learning going on. And so I was like, wow, imagine if, if, if kids all over the world had access to something like this to cover the soft skills. And so synthesis became that. And we have had a bunch of different kids, like over 10,000 kids go through the program um, to play these simulations with kids from all over the world and, and reinforce all these soft skills. But then we were like, okay, well, what about the hardcore academics, right? Um, kids also, of course, need to be exposed to different subjects and different topics. It would be ideal to do it all the time through projects, but sometimes you have to go deeper into like, you know, math concepts, et cetera. And so this year we came out with the second product that's called the synthesis tutor. And so so it's really incredible and it's just the beginning, but we basically found um, what we consider to be the best math teacher out there. His name's Dr. Tanton. He has a PhD from Princeton. He's super passionate because two very different things to be an expert in your content and, uh, and to be a good teacher, right? So he understands the art of teaching and is an expert in his topic. And so we've modeled and recorded him for hours and hours and hours until we've captured every element of his personality and the examples that he uses and the stories and the jokes and the way he gives feedback in a way that encourages you to want to keep going, which we haven't talked about, but in school, it's the opposite. When we give them those bad grades, 
kids don't want to try again. They don't want to see what they got wrong. And therefore, they're not learning from their mistakes. We have it all backwards. Here, we're like, no, no. It's super important that we use the right language to motivate them to want to keep going and to say, wait, what did I get wrong? Okay, how can I improve next time? And so we created this AI tutor that has all those human elements that I think are super important because I was like, okay, I, I love the idea of AI and, and online education and everything, but I also understand how important that human element component is and the connection that you built with your students. And so I was curious how we were going to do that. And then when I tried the product, I was like, wow, I really feel, and I've met and I've spoken a lot of times to Dr. Tenton, I feel like I'm working and learning from Dr. Tenton myself. This is the math tutor that I want for my kid. And so now kids all over the world have access to this and it's infinitely patient. Like it will stay with you until you've mastered the content, which is so vastly different from what we see in school. I would have loved to sit down with every student of mine that had gaps in their knowledge from previous grades until they've mastered the content. But I couldn't. I had to keep going. I had a unit. I had to get the test on Friday, move on, da, da, da. So this kid's just, it's like a treadmill and we're setting them up for failure. They'll never catch up, right? Or very rarely. With something like the math tutor or, you know, the synthesis tutor, they will stay with you until you've mastered the content. And so we've seen that kids are motivated, not by any extrinsic elements, because there are no like points or rewards or characters or colors. Like, no, none of that BS that we have in schools that, you know, focuses on the wrong thing. Here, kids are just engage and they want to keep doing it because they're finally understanding math and it makes sense to them and it's through stories and through examples and they don't feel judged and so and they start to feel competent when many of them were like I hated math I didn't understand math and now I realize wait I'm not actually bad at math I was just not taught the right way and so I'm very optimistic about this product again it's the very beginning, but our, our plan is with the synthesis tutor to cover all the hardcore academics, starting with math. We're going to um, go first for the STEM subjects, so engineering and science, and like we're going to start there first, but eventually we want to cover all of them. So the idea is, and our sort of like dream is that in the future, synthesis covers the soft skills that kids need to thrive in this world that's ever changing, right? And that we don't know the content that they're going to need, but we do know the kind of skills and this attitude of let me figure it out. How do you learn that? By practicing that, right? And so we expose them to complexity. We let them fail. We let them sort of like handle those feelings and pick themselves up and all those things with the fun games and simulations, which we call teams. And then we have the digital tutor that's covering the hardcore um, academics in a few hours a day. And so the kids have the rest of the day to be kids to play around, to engage in whatever it is that they want to do, you know, be around other kids, go to forest schools, go to micro schools, just play around, whatever it is. So we're sort of restoring back kids' childhood, which is the whole point of what we're trying to do. And so that's sort of where we are now. If we have a conversation a year from now, I'm sure we'll, we'll be in a different place. But the whole point is for Synthesis to create a parallel K through 12 system, one remarkable product at a time. And I think that we're on our way. Amazing. And do I mean, is there like a, a funding that uh, that you lean on, or is this uh, is it paying for itself now through um, through well, the fees? It's yeah, yeah. So we, we, we've had, we, we've raised a few rounds and we actually had a crowdfunding source like the last time, because we had a lot of parents and people in the world that want to support this mission because they understand how important it is. So we've been very lucky to have all that funding. And now with the tutor, we're actually starting to finally see everything pay off and we have a lot of students trying it. And so, yeah, so it's been, it's been truly wonderful. And like, you know, the startup world is crazy and, you know, yes. tomorrow this may not work, but what I love about Chris and Josh and Isaac, we always talk about this. It's like, even if this doesn't end up working, we gave it a try and somebody has to try and I know there are a lot of wonderful people working on the alternative education space but I just feel like even if if you know we don't end up achieving this it's it's totally worth our time and effort because the kids deserve it a hundred percent because and this is um you know I've been in in this startup space as well through uh Galileo and Cubrio we we had to rebrand to Cubrio uh it goes through a lot of changes um, because you've got to be agile mm -hmm. and you have to adapt and you've got to cut out the things that aren't going right and kind of double down mm -hmm. on the things that are going right. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen, I've never thought of like synthesis or out school or, you know, any of them or Sora, well, Sora are more, um, you know, physical locations or Lambda, for example, as mm -hmm. being competitors. Like, like, no, like this this has no. to be one huge, giant, great big collaboration Abs. because we need thousands more. We don't need consolidation yes. here. We don't need each other buying each other out and trying mm -hmm. to create a moat. 
because mm-hmm. we've got to be ready when people wake up from that mm-hmm. system because the system mm-hmm. it 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 needs destroying mm-hmm. it's you can't be fixed as you know mm-hmm. i had cory DeAngelis on and you know the mm-hmm. opening question was what you know it, is the education system broken and he's like no it's working perfectly as designed and that's the dark penny drop be- mm-hmm. and they won't change it because it's perfect mm-hmm. as designed so mm-hmm. we have to those of us who have seen it stepped out of it and are happy to to put our reputations on the line stand up against it and say no draw mm-hmm. a land and uh, line in the sand and build something is um yeah it, it, i'm very very bullish on on the future of more ed tech and and hats off to sal khan he really started this kind of movement with khan academy uh but we need more we need we need many many absolutely more. and we need more i think funding. you nailed it we need more venture capitalists yeah. to, to put yeah. money in, in this space totally i think you nailed it it's like we're all it's like the, the enemy is not the other. It's like the traditional school system. We all in the alternative education space need each other. Like I, when I talk about synthesis, that's just one little thing. Like, I don't think that that's the answer to everything. Absolutely not. And I also don't think that every kid, you know, will benefit from synthesis or or that matches their they're learning like the way that they learn, you know, but I do think that, that we, the more people work together and we continue to complement each other and, and, and even build more of the same, like we need more people building in the alternative education space. And so I think it is happening, but like you said, we need it way more, way more, and we need more funding. And, and I think that by having this kind of conversations, um, it's, it's, it helps people realize this. Yeah, well, we're we're in each other's network now, so we can lean yes. on each other's contacts. Absolutely. I'll be more than happy uh, to to introduce you to to anybody that um, we've discussed here, mm-hmm. and we can carry on discussion yeah. uh, for many more years to come. Uh, mm-hmm. But la- last question, um, talking about network, have I heard you talk about Bitcoin at some stage in an interview, or you've had some kind of exposure to it? Uh, you've looked into it, haven't? What what's what's your um, rabbit hole journey so far? So so it's interesting. Um, well, first of all, a- Anthony Pompliano is one of my my good good friends, and so we shared studios here in Miami, and so of course I've been around this whole idea. And so, um, one of when synthesis was starting, and the whole you know Bitcoin was on a rise and everything, we did. We did try with a few things um, to incorporate Bitcoin as part of um, making it more decentralized and using Bitcoin in order to pay. But then that sort of came to a pause because we realized we needed to focus on actually building the product. And so um, I'm I'm all for it. I think that you know it's great that people are having back this autonomy and can make their own decisions. And and again, it goes back to this idea of not letting the system control you, right? So I think that freedom is incredible. And I think that a lot. No, I don't think so. I know that a lot of parents. Uh, in synthesis are Bitcoiners um, and because they, they, we have very similar ideals and philosophies. And I think that, that, yeah. So that's sort of like where, where I am. Awesome. Uh, Yeah. And another shout out to another decentralized education platform system, Sailor Academy. How did I forget? Sailor.org where he's, uh, you know, trying to dematerialize the educational resources to, uh, to make it free for anybody. Uh, which mm-hmm. uh, is great. And Stefan Levera, he has a course on there. I know. Um, and I wonder whether we could ask these guys to, um, because we have a course on Kubrio as well by uh, Dushan. Uh, oh, and that, nice. that's a video course where he takes um, uh, the Bitcoin rabbis, uh, what is money book. And so it's kind of aimed at, I would say between eight to 14 year olds. Uh, and he does a whole nice. video series to it, which is uh, which is awesome. Um, and I'm hoping for any Bitcoiners out there, when we have the next ramp, huge upside, and somebody has the the funds available to to perhaps you know help fund one of these alternative education spaces, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. let's let's keep our fingers crossed, because yeah, this is the only way we rescue humanity is by, uh, you know, decentralizing ourselves and becoming more autonomous, critically thinking and, uh, and building a better future. So mm-hmm. if you could, this is the last question I have to, I have to kind of um, adapt it a little bit. If you could uh, red pill somebody on alternative education, again, in air quotes, uh, who would that person be and why? Oh my God. Um, wow. 
I don't know. You caught me off guard. I, I, I need to think about this. I need to think about this. Let me think about it and I will get back to you and maybe we'll we'll publish this somewhere. But I, I need to think about this one. <laughs> well, that that's that's a perfectly good answer in itself. Okay. I mean, there's no wrong answer to it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it does um Yeah. I mean, somebody with a with with reach, I mean, Elon's already done so much. You know, mm -hmm. he's, he's got how many followers on Twitter and, you know, mm -hmm, how many people mm -hmm. look up to him. Uh, he's, he's already raised the flag on the, mm -hmm. uh, traditional system and the people we've spoken about today obviously have, have done huge work. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. I just wonder how many more people we need to come forward before people really do start taking notice and, uh, understand that it's actually, you know, one of the things, one of the, um, kind of uh, barriers to entry that we faced uh, when we were taking our kids out of school is that the, the pressure, like the peer group pressure from uh, your, your so the social construct around you and being called irresponsible parents for taking your kids out of school. Now, Just... it, it's a clown world. We live in an inverted world. It is actually irresponsible just to put your kids on the big yellow bus and send them off and hope they get back home safely at, and after eight hours with complete strangers. Like you, you've, mm -hmm. you've outsourced your responsibility of your mm -hmm. kid's education mm -hmm. and you're going to mm -hmm. hide behind the excuse of, oh, it's just a bad school. Oh, they got bullied. Oh, there's something wrong with the teacher mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. it's stepping up, taking responsibility, making these decisions, uh, research doing your own research we've talked about a lot of books mm -hmm. here so actionable points are listen to more podcasts read anna's book go check out mm -hmm. synthesis uh there are options and there are solutions and um i just hope more people you know join us on this journey thank you so much i i've really enjoyed talking to you daniel what a great way to end the podcast thank you so much anna for your book and for your work and uh, yeah uh, I look forward to sharing more conversations. Yeah, for sure. Take care.